Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us today for the Oli Foundation webinar, Blenderized Tube Feeding. Thank you again for joining us. My name is Andrea Guidi. I am the Executive Assistant for the Oli Foundation. Most of you are probably familiar with the Oli Foundation, but just in case this is your first experience, I'd like to briefly introduce the organization. The Oli Foundation strives to enrich the lives of those living with home nutrition support, both intravenous nutrition, sometimes called HPN or TPN, and tube feeding. We do this through education, outreach, and networking. The Oli Foundation was founded in 1983 by Dr. Lynn Howard and her patient Clarence Oli Oldenburg. Today, we serve approximately 17,000 members. All of our programs are free of charge for patients and their families. First, we'll go over a few housekeeping details. You should see a toolbar on the right side of your screen. Click on the orange arrow to show the control panel. In the question section, you can type any questions you have for me or for the presenter. Please note we will not be responding to the hand raising function in the control panel. We will answer as many of the questions as possible during the questions and answers period at the end of the presentation. We'll post a recording of the presentation and handouts after the webinar on the OLI website. Please note that we have muted all the participants, so you don't need to worry if there is background noise where you are taking this webinar. If you are having technical issues, please go to the Citrix website at the address on your screen. Now for the presentation. Blenderized tube feeding, BTF, is becoming a more popular option for tube-fed patients, both adults and pediatrics. Lisa will discuss prevalence of the use of BTF, as well as discuss tools needed to blend at home and how to create homemade recipes. The pre-made whole food formulas for both adults and pediatrics will be reviewed. It gives me great pleasure to introduce today's presenter, Lisa F. Lisa is a registered dietitian nutritionist at Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. She received her Bachelor of Science degree from University of Nebraska-Lincoln in 2003 and completed her dietetic internship at Mayo Clinic in 2004. She is a member of the Academy of Nutrin and Dietetics, as well as American Society of Enteral and Parenteral Nutrition. She is an assistant professor in nutrition, Mayo Clinic College of Medicine, and a home enteral nutrition coordinator. Her interests include enteral nutrition in pediatric and adult patients, blenderized tube feeding, and speaking at state and national organizations, such as the American Society of Enteral and Parenteral Nutrition's Clinical Nutrition Week, Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics Food and Nutrition Conference, and with the Oli Foundation. We are thankful to have you presenting today, Lisa, and I will turn the presentation over to you now. All right, thank you. All righty. Okay, well, thank you for that introduction. Um, we have a lot to get through today, and I'm going to do my best to um, get through a lot of the questions that were turned in ahead of time. Um, so I'm going to kind of go quickly through the objectives, since you mentioned those already, and kind of delve right into um, the first question that we have is, who is using blenderized feeding at home? So these are just some photos of some of our patients. We sent cameras home with them and said, show us what you do at home, because I bet it's different than kind of the ideas that we're getting, um, which really opened our eyes to look at, you know, maybe patients are kind of coming up with things on their own at home that we're not aware of. So this led us to our first um, kind of survey of our own patients um, to kind of ask them, are you using blenderized tube feeding at home? Um, and our survey was given to 30 of our home enteral nutrition patients. And of those 30 patients, we found about 55% of them said, yes, I'm putting something other than um, commercial um, standard formula or water and medications through my tube. But the most important thing that we learned is that 90% of them expressed the desire to do blenderized tube feeding if they had adequate information to do so. 
The other thing that we learned from this survey is that of these um, patients that responded, they responded when they used blenderized tube feeding that they had um, no GI symptoms 83% of the time. And on a commercial formula, um, had no GI symptoms only 67% of the time. So that made us think, okay, well, commercial formula is at least or blenderized tube feeding is at least as well tolerated as the commercial formulas that our patients are using. So we further asked them some more questions. And one of the questions was, why are you doing this? And the most common response was that they felt like it was more natural. And the reason why they weren't doing it is because they weren't really aware of it. So, People looked at this survey and said, well, um, your patients are pretty savvy. I bet more, um, more of your patients are doing home blenderized feeding than um, maybe other patients out there. So we decided to provide the exact same survey um, through the Oli Foundation and um, got respondents, both um, pediatric and adults, and we broke those into two categories. So for the pediatrics, we had 125 respondents and found that almost 90% of the people that responded to the survey were getting blenderized tube feeding for an average of 71% of their daily um, calorie intake. And 75% of them were making homemade um, blends and 25% were using a commercial blenderized product. Um, one thing that was important that we noted here is that um, 90 percent of the pediatric patients were not losing weight when they were using the blenderized formula um, compared to around 59 percent um, said that they weren't losing weight so quite a um, with commercial formula so quite a few more kids um, not losing weight with the use of blenderized feeding so then we looked at the adult population and again, Oli Foundation savvy consumers um, expected there to be a higher percentage of respondents using blenderized feeding. Um, and here we see obviously less than in the pediatric group. So 66% of the adult patients that responded um, said they were using blenderized tube feeding for about 50% of their daily intake, but quite a few more were using some of the commercial blenderized products, only 67% were using homemade blends. Um, and kind of the same trends here, you know, reporting less weight loss with the use of blenderized feeding versus commercial formulas. Um, so when comparing those statistically, there was a significance um, showing us that using commercial enteral formula was more likely to lead to weight loss than using blenderized formula. So we looked at those two surveys, the Mayo patients and the Oli patients, both pretty sav savvy groups and said, okay, but we want a bigger, bigger, broader population of respondents. And so um, we were able to get um, about 1,500 respondents to the same survey. Um, and this time it was linked not only on the Oli Foundation website, the Feeding Tube Awareness Foundation website, but also Quorum and Pediatric Home Services, two home medical equipment companies, helped um, helped us get the um, word out about our survey to some of their patients that might not be um, part of one of the two groups that I mentioned, um, which allowed us to get a lot bigger population, but also hopefully a little bit broader population. And when we broke to those two um, groups, um, the pediatric group reported about 24% using blenderized tube feeding and the adult group about 15%, which we feel is probably closer to um, kind of those averages that are happening out there in the um, general population. Um, this was presented as an abstract at Clinical Nutrition Week a couple weeks ago. However, um, we have thousands of data points that we learned from this survey um, that we hope to publish in the very near future. Um, so kind of looking at that, that tells us, okay, pay people are definitely doing blenderized feeding at home, both pediatrics and adults. Um, so the takeaway is that really for the clinicians, um, that we might be losing our patients if, we're if we are refusing to help create recipes um, because they might be going to um, uh, 
non-clinicians or um, just trying to figure out on their own how to create um, home blended recipes. Um, so I really would encourage this to become part of a nutrition assessment where you're asking, okay, you told me you're taking X formula, this amount of water, these medications. Do you put anything else through your feeding tube um, like smoothies or blended fruit or Gatorade or anything like that just to get the story started and help build that rapport? When we sent those cameras that I mentioned home with our patients, um, these were some of the responses that we got back. You have brought the joy of cooking back into my life. I really like it. It makes me feel more normal. I have more energy with blenderized feeding and more regular bowel movements, and I have felt the best I have in 10 years. So when you're hearing responses like that from patients, it's really difficult for us to say, no, you cannot do this. So what is the appeal? I think the general population um, is really looking at our food supply and they're wanting to look on labels for ingredients that they can understand and ingredients that they probably have in their own kitchen. They're wanting personalized nutrition, maybe avoiding certain ingredients or allergens, using cooking for their family member as nurturing or being able to feed their family member the way that the rest of the family eats, whether it be vegan, organic, non-GMO or tomatoes from the garden in summer, um, families are wanting everyone, um, all of their loved ones to get that kind of nutrition. So let's talk a little bit about the clinical benefits. Um, we're gonna talk a little bit about food allergies, some of the GI benefits in terms of improved reflux, bowel regularity, bowel adaptation, and the gut microbiota, which is um, kind of one of those hot topics in nutrition right now. But also, I cannot stress enough the building patient rapport, um, kind of those looks of what are you doing and why are you doing this and I don't want you to do this um, still happen. And that's understandable because we're still learning. However, really encouraging, you know, providers and clinicians to be open to hearing what is it that your patient or family member wants out of, out of their nutrition. So let's start with the um, GI intolerance um, studies. Um, so kind of the first study that ever really showed us um, part of, you know, increasing or improving symptoms with using formula with real food ingredients was in which 33 children were given blenderized feeding. Um, and you can see here that they had a reduction of gagging, overall GI symptoms improved, no child had worsening symptoms, and um, it really did lead to increased oral intake. So really what we're looking at with some of these studies is, you know, studies that have gone through the peer review process um, and that were done on large groups. And you can see as I go through these, these are very small groups. So even though we do have some studies, they, they are small and, and we're still hoping for those large randomized controlled trials to, to help us um, make more clinical decisions. So kind of moving through these, um, the next study that I'll talk about here is with 10 children who had a mean small bowel length of about 48 centimeters. And they were given formula with real food ingredients. And nine of the 10 children were, at, were able to um, transition off an elemental formula ha and had improvement of stooling, which in this case meant less diarrhea, easier to control hydration. And the last one I'll mention here was a group of 18 infants that had diarrhea that were randomized to either blenderized tube, tube feeding or a semi-elemental formula. And in the group that were given the blenderized tube feeding, diarrhea was better and those um, infants had better weight gain um, than the ones that had the semi-elemental formula. So again, small studies, but they are um, kind of all we have right now. So moving on to a pilot that we did here with adult patients, um, nine patients were given blenderized tube feeding their GI symptoms in this population were similar to those um, who were on commercial formulas. None of the patient had a tube site infection or symptoms of foodborne illness, and those with the normal BMI gained weight. 
A few of the patients with a BMI greater than 30 did lose weight, but that was intentional. This last study was one that I was not as familiar with that I came across more recently, which actually was not even a study about blenderized tube feeding. It was a study about um, looking at the gut microbiome of a group of elderly who were living in a long-term care facility. And so the researchers looked at um, stool cultures of 178 elderly, and they really put them into two, two groups based on what their intake was. And what they found was that there was a much healthier, diverse um, amount of good bacteria in patients who had a varied diet, who ate well, who had a variety of foods, and that the group that were on a single formula every day had um, the least amount of healthy bacteria in their gut. And the researchers concluded that a single formula could contribute to long-term ill health in the elderly um, because it was not um, adequately feeding the gut microbiome. So what is the hesitation? And I think, um, you know, even in our schooling as dietitians, we were taught some of these things. And so it's kind of what's on our mind is, is this something that is even safe? Um, so the first one is microbial contamination. Um, there have been some publications that talk about, um, you know, hospitals that are using blenderized tube feeding and having um, a very high amount of bacteria in their formulas. But a couple of things I would like to point out about the studies that are published. They were in hospitals where the temperature is 80 to 90 degrees Fahrenheit and they do not have air conditioning. 98.6% of the blenderized tube feeding formulas actually had unacceptable levels of contamination at the time of preparation. So you can imagine bacteria did increase um, after being in the refrigerator. However, the refrigerator was kept at 48.8 degrees Fahrenheit. And we know that less than having, you know, having our refrigerator at around 40 degrees is, um, is more conducive to decreasing bacterial growth. Um, but even with this amount of contamination and bacteria, there were actually no cases of patients getting ill from contaminated formula. And there aren't any studies that I'm aware of that um, show that patients actually got ill from having increased microbial contamination in their formula. So again, you know, we hear about these, um, the safety and the food safety, but we do really need to look at the specifics of the research done um, to know how applicable that is to our practice, especially when you live here in the freezing cold when it's negative 10 degrees today. Um, there are limited peer review publications about the use of blenderized tube feeding. And um, like I mentioned, we are really hoping to um, increase the literature with some randomized controlled trials. However, one could argue, why do you need studies to prove that food is healthy for people? Um, I think we've proved that orally, that a variety of foods um, are healthy for people. And so I think that is leading to decreased number of people wanting to research this because they feel like we've already done that. We've already proven that food is healthy for people. Um, another hesitation for a clinician would be that we're not exactly sure what's in those, um, you know, homemade blenderized products, and we want to make sure our patients are getting a good nutritional balance. And so how would we accomplish that if they were making their own food at home? Increase, increase in clinicians' time definitely is a hesitation, especially when you don't have um, a lot of experience. However, I think the Registered Dietitian Nutritionist Guide to Homemade Blenderized Feeding that the um, Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics put out in 2016 is very, very helpful and also an indicator that our own academy is encouraging us to learn more about how to help people with blenderized feeding. Potential for increase in costs or losing reimbursement of enteral nutrition supplies may be a hesitation. Tube clogging, tube wearing out more quickly is a hesitation, and it may be more difficult to travel.
lastly, you know, if you have a child or you yourself are somebody who goes in and out of the hospital and you don't have a hospital that supports blenderized feeding, that makes it hard to do um, blenderized feeding at home and then having to go to use something differently, uh, different while hospitalized. So here are some criteria that um, kind of we recommend before um, realizing if blenderized tube feeding is for you. So definitely talking with your primary care provider or your child's primary care provider that this is something that you are interested in. Um, we recommend our patients have a mature stoma, though this isn't set in stone. And the reason for that is because if we happen to get a tube clog in those first six weeks after a tube is placed, it's much riskier to have to change the feeding tube than it would be if the tube has been in for three months and we accidentally don't blend an olive well enough and that clogs up the tube. It's much less risky to change the tube after that time. 14 French or greater tube. However, smaller French sizes may work with some of the commercial formulas, which we'll talk about here in a minute. And if you thin out the, the home blends, a smaller French size would work. It just would increase the volume needed. So for anyone who's volume sensitive, um, a smaller French size may be prohibited. Having a system in place for monitoring. So just like with any change, um, we wanna make sure that after we make that change, we follow up to see how it's going, um, making sure that there aren't any adjustments needed along the way. Having adequate of equipment available. So when I have somebody come into the office and say, I wanna start blenderized tube feeding, that visit is really a planning visit. Um, and then um, I really encourage them, okay, now you need to go get your blender, go get your food, you know, come up with some sample recipes together and then come back and talk about implementing that. So um, kind of having that good preparation ahead of time. And then having a nutrition professional professional available to help you with making recipes is also recommended. So I just want to um, talk briefly about hospital blenderized feeding because this was a few of the questions that came in ahead of time. Um, and we do actually have a protocol for using blenderized feeding that could be its own um, whole hour um, dedicated to that. Um, but I just want to kind of give you a few of the ba basics. The first part of the protocol really talks about, first of all, is it safe to use blenderized tube feeding in this patient? So we do not allow it to be used for critically ill patients in the ICU um, just because, um, you know, we wouldn't send a piece of pizza up to the ICU for a patient to um, you know, was not hemodynamically stable, which can increase their risk for um, bowel ischemia or bowel perforation um, if they're getting especially fiber um, in their tube feeds. So um, that's one of the things that we kind of look at, though, you know, we have our you know, kids who get bone marrow transplants that are in the ICU for three months, yeah, we definitely still let them use blenderized feed feeding there. So it's really looking at, you know, their stability and how ill are they and would it be safe to give whole foods to the patient. We also prefer not to start blenderized feeding in the hospital just because logistically it is difficult to come up with a whole plan in a hospitalized setting. Um, we prefer to do that in the outpatient setting. If those two things are not issues, then normally what we do is use the patient's home, home program. So we have room service here in which patients call down and order their food. And we have a pureed menu. And so for example, if I was calling down for my child, I would call down and say, um, I'm calling to order blenderized tube feeding from the pureed menu. And I would like pureed chicken, pureed green beans, uh, bananas, yogurt, and whole milk um, for my child's lunch. That then actually goes down the tray line, which already has a system in place for monitoring food temperatures, food preparation, and food safety. And at the end of the tray line, we have a commercial grade blender that all of those pureed products go into. Um, and then it's put into a jug similar that we use for our mixed commercial formulas and sent up to the patient's room on the tray. 
exactly the same way a tray is sent if a child or a patient is eating orally. That really allows us to keep within our food safety parameters, monitoring parameters, and nursing knows, oh, a tray is here. That means I need to really make sure my patient's gonna get their meal in the next 30 minutes, or I need to refrigerate this. So we have really chosen to look at our home blenderized, or our blenderized feeding in the hospital as a tray rather than a mixed formula. Um, but we have also decided to have a commercial blenderized product on hand um, so patients can use that in the hospital because if the patient or caregiver can't administer the blenderized feeding themselves or they can't order it themselves, nursing really isn't able to call down, make up recipes by ordering their food, and then sit at the base patient's bedside for 30 minutes administering the feeding. So that is why we have the commercial blenderized products as a backup plan. Another question that I had had um, was about post-pyloric feeding. And our preference for post-pyloric feeding is that we use a commercial blenderized product. And it's mostly because of the hang time of food, which I'll talk about here in a minute, but it's two hours. So homemade blenderized tube feeding should not be at room temperature for greater than two hours. And if we have to use a pump to administer that, um, it just gets really hard to be compliant within that two hour hang time. However, I will say that some patients do tolerate bolus feeding into their small intestine, especially those that have had gastric bypass surgery or maybe an esophagectomy where they've already been used to eating orally without a stomach, they may be able to um, tolerate some bolus blenderized feeding into the small intestine. But definitely more experience and some research is needed here to look at, can we put blended chicken directly into the small intestine and can, can patients digest and absorb that? Are there certain patients that can? Are there some that can't? Does it take more time to get um, tolerant to that? So those are really questions that I just unfortunately can't answer yet. So we talked about some of the tools that will be needed, um, having a nutrition professional available, having a plan in place, getting your supplies ready prior to the day that you're gonna get started on blenderized feeding. So some people will ask, well, what is the best blender? Um, and we did actually test a variety of blenders and found that the Vitamix does seem to blend um, especially thicker foods better um, than any of the other um, ones that you see there that we tested. However, the Ninja system really came in a close second. So when you look at cost, um, sometimes that um, Ninja might be a, a more reasonable option for patients. But what we did find is that increasing how long we blended the food did um, make those less powerful, maybe less expensive blenders um, work a lot better at um, increasing or, you know, blending the food better. Um, O-ring syringes seem to work best for um, bolus feedings because they don't get sticky and are easier to push. Using a straight extension set for the low profile tubes instead of the right angle so the food doesn't have to go around the corner. So a couple of other things about supplies. Um, I did get quite a few questions about um, how do you use a pump with blenderized feeding? And really what I have to say here is that the manufacturers of feeding pumps have said that their pumps should not be used with anything except for commercial formula. Um, therefore, if you're using a pump for homemade blenderized feeding, you're doing so at your own risk. Now, I will tell you that um, I did learn at Clinical Nutrition Week that the new Kangaroo Connect is, it was not made for blenderized feeding, but they feel like it may be easier um, to administer blenderized feeding because there's going to be less pump alarm as there's different um, particle sizes within the formula. Um, so I would um, kind of possibly look into that option. The other thing that um, 
I will mention about pumps is that the accuracy of the pump definitely changes once you put whole um, food into the feeding bag. So I've referenced here a poster from Clinical Nutrition Week, but they really, in testing um, some of the tubes, found that um, blenderized formula had between a 17 and 88% accuracy. Um, so 17% accuracy is not very high, which means, um, you know, your patient is going to be really need to adjust their rate at home based on their daily volume, not based on mils per hour, because it seems like those thicker formulas aren't as um, accurate. When using gravity bags, the large bore gravity bags seem to work better. We mentioned the syringes. And then again, perishable food should not be left out at room temperature for more than two hours and one hour when the temp temperature is above 90. So we really give three ways to um, make recipes. The first one would be with exchanges. The second would be to use a standardized recipe where though I don't really recommend that very often. And the last one would be plate method or using the family meal. So let's look at the exchanges. So this is a sample 500 calorie recipe that would be um, a good combination of protein, carbohydrate, and fat, um, and would contain food from each of the food groups. The nice thing about this recipe, we've used this for a lot of different um, blenderized tube feeding patients, is you can double it, triple it, quadruple it, half it, and you still have a nutritionally complete product um, that's not too high in fruits and has no meat or has too much protein and not enough carbohydrate. So it's a good way to really make sure that you have the right amounts of each food. And again, you can double it, triple it, quadruple it for whatever calorie level you're looking for. This would be an example of a standardized recipe that we do have in our hospital. So if someone didn't want to call down and order a meal and they say, oh yeah, I'm a I'm a big guy, I'm going through rehab and my lunch, I like my meals to be about a thousand calories, do whatever you want with it. This would be an example of a recipe that we would make using the food on tray line and send it up on a lunch tray. This is really the method that I prefer uh, when it comes to building blenderized recipes. So if you go to the choosemyplate.gov website, it gives you a variety of calorie levels and at that calorie level it tells you how many servings of each food you would need to come up with a nutritionally complete um, recipe. Now a couple things that I will mention about this. Um, I do recommend that people season the foods the same way they would if they were eating them because blenderized feeding can get low in sodium, potassium, and, and other micronutrients. So for example, if someone is making um, green beans, I would say if you would normally put butter, salt, and pepper on green beans for your family, you would put butter, salt, and pepper on your green beans for your family member that's going to be using this in tube feeding. It's a good way to um, make sure that you're getting enough salt, but also just treating this just like food that we would be eating by mouth. Here are some examples of foods that blend well um, that can be used in each food group. Um, and it kind of gives you an idea, the fat, for example, of what counts as a serving of fat. So a half a teaspoon of oil, a half a tablespoon of butter, or 10 olives could all be counted as one fat um, serving. Um, so just to give you some idea of some foods that do blend well, um, I kind of gave you each of those um, in each category. So some of the things that do come up in kind of shortcomings for recipes that people make. So sometimes I get a consult and somebody comes in and says, I've been doing blenderized feeding for the last couple of weeks and I just want you to look over what I'm doing and help me tweak that. Um, I say the number one thing I probably get is people using too many fruits and vegetables because they get so excited about using healthy foods. 
that they might overdo it with fruits and vegetables, which then just doesn't allow enough room for the other things their body needs. Now, if volume isn't an issue, they can use as many fruits and vegetables as they want. I think um, using protein powder ends up being a little bit of a um, shortcoming as well. Um, you know, sometimes people have this idea that they need a lot of protein, and we do need protein, but a lot of times that can be met with um, beans and tofu and milk and, and animal products as well. So um, a lot of times protein powder wouldn't be needed. I mentioned about the salt and potassium, just making sure that we're seasoning our food. But sometimes we do need to add salt, um, and that would be kind of decided with your healthcare provider. Sometimes patients forget to put carbohydrate, put too much water, or not enough water. So when we look at monitoring these patients, it's really the same as all other enterally fed patients. So if you look at the Aspen practice guidelines, um, there isn't really a strong recommendation for routine lab monitoring for enterally fed patients. Um, there's not a recommendation for giving a daily multivitamin unless you know that the patient is not meeting their vitamin and mineral needs. So our, um, our protocol for monitoring is just to supplement as needed. And so if someone is not getting adequate calcium, of course, we're going to give them a calcium supplement. But if they're getting three cups of milk a day um, in their blends, we're not going to give them a calcium supplement. So I just want to touch briefly on some of the products that are out there for commercial blenderized product. This is meant for information only and not to promote any of these products. Um, and most of the information I have on the slides was taken from the company websites. So here's a list of the current um, products that I'm aware of that contain blenderized food or real food ingredients. Um, that um, are on the market. The last one, Ultrient, I don't have a lot of information about. Um, all I know is that it's a product that's going to have pea and rice, and it's going to come in a bag already that actually connects directly to a feeding tube, and then it might be coming out in the next few months. Um, so I don't know much about that one, but we'll talk about the other four groups. So what are some pros of using the commercial blenderized products? It's precise, you know exactly what is in there in terms of micronutrients and macronutrients. It's convenient, it's already made, and it has a more consistent viscosity, so you're not worried about how much fluid to add. The cons is there aren't a lot of peer-reviewed publications um, about these products. They're just new, and it, it takes time to do the studies and get them published and go through the peer review process, so we don't have a lot there possibly decrease the pump accuracy, like I mentioned. Could be difficult to get insurance coverage just because the codes are more of specialty codes, um, though I have definitely seen a big improvement in um, a variety of insurances, Medicaid, Medicare, and private insurances um, covering these products. Um, and supplier availability, not knowing where to get them. Again, this has dramatically improved as well, and, and we're able to find these products at a lot of our home medical equip equipment companies now. So starting with real food blends, um, you can kind of see some of the specs here, but I'll just point out a couple of the, the main points. Um, when looking at real food blends, they're really meant for both kids and adults, um, but it's just food. It doesn't have any vitamins or minerals added to it. Um, so it's not considered a, quote, complete nutrition product. However, if my child was eating salmon and oats and veggies for dinner, I'm not sure that I wouldn't not consider that um, complete. Um, and so I think that can be taken um, just per clinician's um, experience. The other thing to know about this is it does have an only a two hour hang time. So again, you would not be wanting to water it down, putting it on a pump and letting it run for 12 hours. So Nourish and Liquid Hope, again, you can look at some of the specs here. So some pros here is it has a 12 hour hang time. So easier to put on a pump. Has, it's nutritionally complete. There are specific products for adults and pediatrics to better meet their vitamin and mineral needs. 
Um, and the con that I feel like there is, is there's no fruit or fruit juice in the product and um, just something that we want to encourage a variety of fruits, but definitely anything could be added into that product as well. Complete and Complete Pediatric. This is a reformulated version of a formula that's been on the market for a long time. Um, however, these are from real food ingredients, not blended whole foods. So the consistency is thinner and may not give as much of a benefit when it comes to that, you know, bowel, um, you know, bowel consistency, reflux, regurgitation, things like that. Um, but one of the positives about it is, is it can be actually used in eight French tubes or greater and can be used with gravity or pump without dilution. So it could be used in nasal tubes. A new product that will be coming out, uh, Complete Organic Blends. Um, you can see kind of there's an adult and pediatric version here. Um, it's a blended tube feeding product from whole fruit, whole foods, not, not food ingredients. Nutritionally complete, compatible with pumps. Um, we'll have a 12 hour hang time, but you do need a 12 French or larger tube. And it would be difficult to use this product with gravity feeding um, because of the viscosity. So it might need to be thinned down if you were using it for gravity. Kate Farms products, um, there's a couple of them, which I'll mention on the next slide, but you can see they're compatible with pumps. They have a 12 hour hang time, nutritionally complete. Um, but again, they're made with food ingredients, not blended foods. And so the consistency is thinner than some of the other products I mentioned. So they have their complete product, which is meant for oral intake. Um, it could be used as an oral supplement or, or as sole source of nutrition. Um, they have their core essentials, which is kind of their standard tube feeding formula. Um, and they have their Peptide Plus 1.5, which is made from hydrolyzed pea protein as well as MCT oil from coconut. Um, and again, um, that's in one of those specialty category, formula categories that we might need extra documentation to get that covered by insurance. So kind of looking at some of the things in between that you may not think of blenderized feeding would be things like alcohol through a feeding tube, coffee, smoothies, you know, birthday cake on their birthday, seasonal foods, Gatorade, Powerade, things like that. Um, those are things that can make, make people feel like they are having more control over what's going in their body as well. So I want to allow enough time for questions. So I'm going to go through these slides on NFIT very, very quickly. Um, so we can try to have at least 15 minutes for questions. So um, we have done a couple of studies on the um, flow um, of blenderized feeding through the new NFIT connectors, as well as the force that it would take to push feeding through the new enteral connectors. So this was the initial study that we did. It was published in 2017. However, um, what we did is we took six um, enteral feeding formulas and we um, put them through a syringe with both NFIT and um, our current feeding tubes, which we'll call Legacy. And we found that it would definitely take longer to push some of the thicker, more viscous um, formulas. So from 15 minutes now with the Legacy tube up to maybe 30 to 40 minutes with the new NFIT tubes. However, these were done with prototypes. So we were able to then obtain all of the different NFIT tubes that are currently on the market, as well as their version of the current legacy tubes. And enteral feeding was simulated um, with gravity, gravity feeding. And we found that there was no difference if you were gravity flowing with the syringe um, or a gravity bag, there was no difference between with the low profile tube, the 18 French tube or the 20 French tube. A standard 14 French tube and 24 French tube did have a slower flow rate with NFIT, uh, 
However, one thing that's difficult to interpret here is everyone's homemade blenderized tube feeding is so different um, that it's really hard to know if you had a 14 French tube, would your recipe be different? Um, so that was kind of a limitation to the study. Um, we did additional um, testing then using um, the force of a syringe to see would it take more effort to um, push that viscous formula through the tube. Um, and we definitely um, found that viscous formula may be difficult to push. However, it would be dependent on what blender was used, how long the formula was blended, what is the viscosity. Um, you know, people do so many different things with their home blends. It's really just important that we're gonna be monitoring people closely to make sure that, you know, this change does not um, decrease um, compliance with how much tube feeding they're giving because it's taking more time. So in conclusion, um, it does seem like a lot of patients are starting to use blenderized feeding. We can definitely meet the nutrition needs of these patients, especially with the help of a dietitian. For patients who are syringe feeding, there does not seem to be a lot of difference between NFIT and legacy tubes. But again, um, depending on how you prepare your home blenderized feeding, patients are definitely going to need to be monitored closely. And if they're gravity feeding, we're going to really want to monitor them closely if they have a thicker formula to make sure that it's still able to go through the tube and doesn't need to be modified in any way um, to allow them to still get blenderized feeding at home. So with that, I will open it up to questions and hopefully um, we have enough time to answer as many as we can. Great, Lisa. Thanks so much. Uh, great job incorporating a lot of information into a short time that we had. Now we'll begin the question and answer session. If you haven't already done so, feel free to submit your questions in the question section of the toolbar on the right side of your screen. Um, we've had a lot of questions come in, so we're going to do our best to get to as many as we can. And Lisa has generously offered to answer the questions we don't get to, and those questions and answers will be available on our website. So let's start with, um, we have one coming in. Can patients new to tube feeding who will need tube feeding only for a short time during cancer treatment successfully use blenderized tube feedings? I would say yes, and this is a large portion of our, um, of our patients that are using blenderized feeding. Um, so I had mentioned that we prefer the stoma to be um, mature before we do blenderized feeding, however, um, you know, that's just a guideline. And if someone is going through chemo and radiation for head and neck cancer, we're definitely willing to work with them to um, kind of troubleshoot and find um, a recipe that works for them. However, we do recommend if possible for them to have some kind of commercial formula, um, whether it be blenderized or non-blenderized as a backup, just in case it's a day where they don't feel good or a meal where they don't feel good and they don't feel like blending, we want to have something to fall back on. Great. How important is it to let a patient taste food before feeding it if they are 100% tube fed? Hmm. That's a great question. We don't normally have, you know, worry too much about patients tasting food. However, in infants who have not had um, exposure to any food before, we do the same thing as you would for an orally fed child. So offering for example, baby food, green beans for three days through the tube as a way to sit, kind of say, okay, no reaction to green beans. And then trying to do that with five to 10 foods before we start to build recipes to make sure that there aren't any allergic reactions. Great. Uh, we have another one coming in. Um, how can I get enough calories in such diluted food? So one of the things that we have tried to do is not include water 
in our blends. So trying to use um, liquids that have calories and protein, whether it be heavy whipping cream or soy milk, um, you know, using fruits that have more fluid um, to get our fluid intake rather than diluting with water, but then also really falling back on those calorie dense foods. For example, grape nuts, you can get a lot more calories out of a small volume than you can, for example, um, pasta. Or you can get a lot more calories out of raisins than you can out of grapes. So when we need a lot of calories in a smaller volume, we like to use more of those calorie-dense foods, you know, using oils and things like that. Great. Um, any suggestions to avoid coagulation of blenderized two feed for patients home tube feeding? So one thing I have kind of learned is that normally the blend needs to be re-blended right before use. So even if it's a family who blends the night before for their meals for the next day, um, that normally the amount that's going to be fed at that time, either with an immersion blender that you can just kind of stick into it and blend it up, or actually putting it back in the blender. But um, I don't think it works very well just to take something straight from their freezer to the refrigerator to thaw right to feeding. Usually you do have to re-blend it. Okay, great. Thanks, Lisa. Um, how do you ensure patients are receiving the correct vitamins and minerals when using homemade blenderized diets? So if I'm worried about it, I will use a program like Nutritionist Pro to put in what they're um, utilizing so I can see exactly what, what um, micronutrients they're getting. However, if they're using the myplate.gov and getting all the recommended serving of fruits and veggies and grains and, and healthy fats, and protein sources, um, I really don't um, kind of calculate those things just because we wouldn't calculate those in, in people who are eating um, as long as they were eating a variety of foods. So I only do that um, in a program when I'm worried that they're not getting a variety of foods or if their calorie needs are very low, that it would be difficult to meet their vitamin and mineral needs with a small amount of food. Okay, great. Lisa, what are the best carbohydrates, protein, fat sources to use in blenderized tube feeding in terms of ease of provision and mixing? Mm -hmm. So the slide that I had that kind of showed that list of what, um, what mixes well would be a good reference. But for example, carbohydrates, what I have found is that like toasted bread blends really well, but a piece of bread that's just fresh made kind of just, do, you know, balls up or doughs up. So something that's a little bit crispier that can be dissolved um, definitely blends well. I have found that brown rice blends easier than white rice because white rice kind of gums up as well. In terms of protein sources, I really haven't found a protein source that does not blend well. Um, and then fats, you know, again, most, most fat sources do blend well. One thing that does take a little bit of extra power um, would be like seeds. If you were going to use a whole seed or something like whole olives, um, then I just recommend that you have, you know, a high powered blender. But um, there's definitely foods in each of those food groups that are easy to blend. And like I said, I would look at that slide that I gave a few examples. Okay. And again, um, these slides we will have available on our website so people can refer back to them. Uh, Lisa, what resources would you tell families to use to create recipes for blenderizing their own foods? Mm -hmm. I really like the myplate.gov super trackers. I really like um, the calorie levels that are set there and then they give you at each calorie level the amount of fruit and veggies and protein and all of those things that are needed. It's a government source so I, I feel like it's a reputable website that gets updated um, regularly. So that's one. Um, and you know I have used some of the recipes in the homemade blended diet handbook um, which I think I have referenced at the end of my slides. 
Um, but I will say that is something that is lacking is how, how to build recipes. Though I think it's lacking because clinicians are hesitant to put some of that information out there that can just be used by everyone um, that you really would want to be, you know, meeting with a dietitian or healthcare professional that's comfortable in helping build recipes. Um, because each each patient is so different that having some of those standard recipes, you know, might be harmful. Great. Uh, I have two questions um, together. Um, how do you typically get someone started with blenderizing? And how do we get our nutritionists on board with blended diets? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so normally, if someone's on like all standard commercial formula, we'll start by saying, let's choose one meal, for example, let's choose breakfast and come up with a recipe for that. In general, I think taking 25% of their daily intake and trying to convert that to blenderized feeding first. Um, but what ends up happening to at least me in practice is that we end up starting with blenderized snacks. So for example, if they're on three meals a day of commercial standard formula and they're still losing weight or still feeling hungry, I feel like, okay, this would be an opportunity to say, let's take some yogurt and a banana and blend that together for a um, snack, you know, mid-afternoon snack. How do you tolerate that? Do you mind the work of blending? You know, do you feel good with that? And if, if they like that or, you know, an evening snack or something, then we might start to transition meal by meal. But in general, I think if you look at the, um, the Registered Dietitian Nutritionist Guide to Homemade bl or to Blenderized Tube Feeding on the Academy website, they recommend starting with 25% of calories um, transition and then slowly go up from that. Great. And then in terms of getting your nutritionist on board, I think one thing that would be helpful is just sharing some of the resources that I have on my slides. Um, especially ones that are from Academy and Nutrition and Dietetics and from American, American Society of Enteral and Parental Nutrition, because those are really our kind of governing bodies and where we go to for information. So I kind of feel like if, if they're putting out information of how to do blenderized feeding, then, um, you know, that makes me more open to wanting to do it because obviously my academy is giving me resources to doing that. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, we have one coming in. Best practice for present, uh, preventing flow errors when using blenderized food. Yeah, there was a lot of questions ahead of time on this. And I hate to answer questions this way, but really what I have to say is you shouldn't be using a feeding pump for homemade blenderized feeding um, because they're not really meant for that. I know that there are there is information out there about how to modify pumps and how to modify pump bags, but as a clinician, those are harder things to support. Um, you know, I'm looking forward to potentially a company says that they're working on creating a pump for um, blenderized feeding, and and hopefully that will help solve some of these issues that we're having. Great, and we have time for one more, Lisa. Um, what are some coping strategies for blenderized folks who are traveling? I Any like, suggestions? Yeah. yeah, I think, well, a couple of things. Number one, having, having a blender that you can travel with, like an immersion blender, makes it a little bit easier than carting around, you know, a large blender. However, I really do feel like having, you know, this is a great place for having a commercial blenderized formula as a backup plan to say, you know, I can just open a carton or I can just open a pouch and do that on the plane. You know, I'm on an eight hour plane ride because really, how would you keep home blended feeding, you know, at proper temperature, keep it from coagulating, keep it stored? Um, I really, I, I really think having some of those commercial products as a backup plan um, is really helpful when it comes to traveling. That's great. Thanks so much, Lisa. Um, we do have um, a page here on the OLE website where you can find all our resources for blenderized tube feedings. 
And thank you to Lisa for an excellent presentation today. We appreciate you sharing your expertise with us. Many thanks to Halyard for supporting this important educational program. Thank you also to participants for joining us today. We'll post a recording of the presentation on the OLE website in case you'd like to view it again. We hope you will join us for another webinar. To view our schedule of upcoming webinars and past recordings, visit the OLE website at ole.org webinars. And that is it for today. Thank you all for joining us and have a pleasant afternoon.